the Buddha recommends that reflection on karma. I'm the owner of my actions. All living beings are the owners of their actions. Whatever I do, to that will I fall heir. Whatever they do, to that will they fall heir. And it's interesting, you notice that in the different contexts, that reflection serves different purposes. It's based, of course, on the conviction that your actions really do make a difference. It's a point that the Buddha can't prove for you. As he says, you'll know it when awakening comes, that yes, that was true. It was because you made choices, and your choices had power, that you were able to gain awakening. Up until that point, you don't know for sure, but you take it as a working hypothesis. Because you see that if you do, you're more likely to act in skillful ways. If you don't, you're more likely to act in unskillful ways. If your actions don't matter, why bother being careful about them? So that's the basic premise, that our actions matter, that you're making the choices. And the quality of the result is going to depend on the quality of the intention that goes in. And the quality of the intention is not just good, it has to be skillful. That means it's good plus devoid of delusion. Because all too many times when we act on good intentions but we don't really know what we're doing, or we're not really clear on some of the underlying intentions that are lurking around our actions. Those kind of actions don't necessarily give good results. So we're trying to work for skillful intentions. It means that we take into consideration what we've learned from our actions. This is why the Buddha, when he was teaching Rahula, said not only to look at your intentions, but also look at the results of your actions as they're happening and after they're done. This is based on the principle of causality, that some causes give results right away. Others wait for a while. But then you look at those results, and if they're bad, you resolve not to repeat that action again. You've learned something. So you judge your actions both by your intentions and by the results, and you refine your intentions by taking past results into consideration. This is another thing you have to take on faith, which is that there is a pattern. It's not all random. It's very easy to look at life and see, make things look pretty random. Who dies, who doesn't die? As the Buddha said, you have to have a long, long, long understanding of rebirth and karma to see that, yes, the results of an action really do come out in line with the intention. Because sometimes it takes a very long time, many lifetimes, before the results of an action will come out. This is another reason why I have to take it on, take it on faith. Even though we don't like the word faith in Buddhist circles, most of us have left another religion because of its faith demands. But here, what are you being asked to believe? Action. Do follow a pattern, and you can learn that pattern by looking at your intentions, looking at the results. You are able to learn. That's one of the best assumptions you can make. And then based on that, then you can use this contemplation to help you get more skillful in your actions. In that contemplation with the five reflections, the Buddha says all five together are meant to induce heedfulness. When you look at all the things that you could be going for and realizing that life is short, aging, illness, and death are creeping up all the time, and as I say in the Thai translation for that chant, these things are normal. 
separation from the people and the things we love, that's normal. All we have to hold on to is our actions. When you're thinking those ways, you realize, I've got to be very careful about how I act. That reflection induces heedfulness. But in so doing, reflection on karma is a little bit different from the others. The others, are, when you look at them, they're pretty depressing. They give rise to a sense of sangwega. You think of all the things you do in life, and they're all going to end. And you pick up the pieces, and you put them back together again, and then it goes to pieces again, again and again and again. What's the way out? Your actions. In this sense, the reflection on karma is induces basada, a sense of confidence that there is a way out, that you can find it. That's something within your power. This is a message that the world around us tends to, to stomp on, which is why when you're away from the monastery you have to be very careful about your values. Don't let the world stomp on your values. The conviction that a timeless, deathless happiness is possible. And whatever efforts you put in that direction are well directed. The world will say otherwise. So they say that kind of happiness is impossible. Nobody's ever really attained it. You get psychotherapists writing books about the Buddha and talking about what a deluded person he was. Or maybe not the Buddha, but maybe the, the monks who transmitted his teachings. And this is something that's always amazed me. That people will say, "Well, the Buddha was a great teacher, but the people he left behind didn't understand what he was saying." If he didn't understand what he was saying, then he wasn't a great teacher. As he said, the Dharma was well taught. His disciples were had practiced well in line with the Dharma. And so the message they transmitted was a good message. And we want to keep that message alive in our hearts. Because as people practicing the Dharma everywhere in the world, it's countercultural, even in societies that are nominally Buddhist. The people who practice are the exception. And the values of the society tend to go off in other directions. Simply that in those societies, some of the values of Buddhism in terms of patience and endurance and generosity, goodwill, have seeped more into the society than this moon we're on here in America. We're a little moon colony. But still, the idea that you would really be seriously practicing for the sake of nirvana, that's something that people, even in those societies, finds it goes against the grain. So wherever you are as a practitioner, you've got to maintain your values. So confidence in the power of your action is an important value to maintain. Now the contemplation of all beings are the owners of their actions. That serves two functions as well. Again, there's a sense of sangwega, that wherever you go. No matter what level of being you might aspire to in this life or the next life, it all ends in aging, illness, and death. And the good levels of being are maintained by good actions. And you know how people are about good actions. Remember the Buddha's teaching that the mind can change so fast that there's nothing to compare it with how fast that is. That gives you a sense of how precarious the whole thing is. Even more dedication to wanting to find a way out. But the reflection on karma also is a kind of reflection to induce equanimity for the things you can't change, particularly things that you've already done in the past, or the results of things you've done in the past.
things that you've done, things that other people have done. There are people you want to help, but you can't help them because of their karma. Sometimes you can't help them because of your karma. And so instead of banging your head against the wall, against things you can't change, you learn to, to regard them with equanimity and look around and say, well, what can I change? Because the most important things in life are things you can change, your intentions, the state of your mind. This is why we meditate, so we can see our intentions clearly and gain some more control over them, turn them in a good direction. Because after all, what are you doing as you meditate? You are making up your mind to do something. You're going to focus on the breath. And then you want to make sure that no other intention comes in to divert you from where you really want to be, what you really want to do. And so you have to become more and more mindful, more and more alert, more discerning gain more concentration so you can see the mind more clearly, and giving that sense of well-being that comes from the concentration. The Buddha compares it to food. You're in a better position to be able to say no to the unskillful intentions. So we practice equanimity not just to give up on things, but basically to channel our attention, channel our efforts in the right direction. So regardless of, the world is, of what the world is doing, what the world says, we know that these assumptions are good assumptions, and you want to act on them. Years back I was writing an article for Tricycle. And I was talking about how, based on the assumptions here that we'd have, you would have to act in a better way. And the editor was curious about that until he realized, oh, what I mean is that people actually act on their assumptions. Because you look at most people's minds, they have all kinds of battling assumptions inside. And their mouths may be saying they believe in one thing, and their actions say they're believing in something else. What the Buddha is trying to do is get your mouth in line with your actions, your theory in line with the actual choices you make. Because when you do that, you can develop something of substance. This is why determination is one of the perfections. You make up your mind that this is what you want to do, and then you try to put together everything that's needed to make that happen. And that includes having the right views to direct your actions and to help you reflect on what you're doing. So when we talk about having faith in the principle of karma, it's not just saying, oh yes, I think that's a good idea. It means you have faith in the people who are teaching it, and you also try to act in line with that. The Buddha makes this point over and over again, that you your actions show what you really believe in. So you want to believe in something to make sure that your actions are good. That gives you not only the theory, but also the, the emotions, the sense of sanguega, the sense of basada, heedfulness, equanimity, as these things are needed. So the teaching on karma is not just an intellectual assent, or something you want to give your intellectual assent to, but it's something you assent to with your whole heart, and you carry it out into your actions. Because it's in that way that you benefit the most from it. As you bring your actions and your theory into line, or bring your actions into line with the theory. When the Buddha gained awakening, he learned an awful lot of things, but he taught only the things that he said are useful putting it, for putting it into suffering. And the teaching on karma is one of those useful teachings. So it learned how to make good use of it, and you find that the Buddha is right. It really is a necessary part of right view.
to give you direction, to give you motivation, so you can reach the point where you can confirm that, yes, it was true. But we're not just trying to confirm that. When you reach that point, you'll also find that you found the ultimate happiness, and that's what this teaching is all about. Sometimes it sounds like karma is there to assign blame to people who are suffering, or to say so-and-so deserves suffering. But that's not the case. That's a misuse of the teaching. The teaching is there to point out that you have this power here in the present moment to do good or to do evil. So be very careful about how you use it. If you use it well, it can take you all the way to the goal that the Buddha found, a deathless happiness. It's at that point that you really understand it. If you understand not only the meaning of the words, but also the purpose of the words. And that the Buddha is right. There is a deathless happiness. That's the most important thing that he's right about. And everything else he teaches points in that direction. <laughs>